So my name is Karen Bradley. I am the chair of the Old School Community Gathering Place board and um, also basically overseeing all of the programs here at the Old School. We do many things here. We have a youth skills program. We have a seniors program. We have a fiber friends going on across the hall right now. We have a dance therapy program. We have lots of things happening for the community. And um, about three years ago, we started to notice the housing crisis. And that is because we have people living in their cars here, living in tents, people who are getting uh, you know, kicked out of their homes basically because the rents are going up too high for them to be able to, to afford it. So we began to be aware of it and we started to look for funding to help people get back into housing or to figure out how to solve the problem, at least for this community. We can't solve it for the world. We can't solve it for Canada. We can't even solve it for Nova Scotia, but we can do a lot for this place. And right now we have a database of approximately 200 individuals and families who are in need of housing, affordable housing, you know, even market value housing, but also supportive housing, transitional housing, emergency housing, all levels of housing um, are needed here. But we are also, you know, a small village in the middle of uh, the Halifax Regional Municipality and the needs are great everywhere. So we've been spending a lot of time talking amongst ourselves and looking at the real estate that we have in the area, the assets we have in the area, to begin to see how we could begin as a community to address some of these challenges. And the old school has been leading this because we are the charitable organization of the community, but there are many other people who have been interested. So the first thing that happened was we got some funding from United Way to look at some emergency housing navigation needs. So we hired somebody very part-time to actually help people with paperwork, to look at the real estate that is available, the apartments that might be available, and to start thinking ahead you know, for the future. And then we, the Department of Community Services came along from the province and offered um, us a full-time position funded fu fully by them and so the little bit of part-time money that we had became support money for people in need. So our emergency services navigator does things like help people apply for the housing uh, supports and or looks at real estate that might be available. An apartment or comes available, she'll call and ask if it's appropriate for this person or that person. She tries to help people navigate their way into housing. Um, and then also last winter during the polar vortex, we were asked to house people who were homeless for that warming center. And so some of those people that we worked with then have become our clients long term, um, looking for all kinds of supports, pharmacare, um, emergency housing supports, um, the, the challenges of navigating the rental subsidies, the heating subsidies and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of programs out there, but for the average person who's struggling with wondering whether or not they're gonna be able to pay the rent or even have a house to pay rent on next month, navigating that is extremely difficult. So that is a lot of what we do here. So we also had this dream of having um, units, housing units that would be in the center of the village and we've partnered up with John Wesley Chisholm, who's running a program called Harbor Garden Village. Um, and we are creating, dreaming, <laughs> imagining, and actually working toward having a community center in the middle. It's not a suburban mall. It is an enclave of small homes. There's a small hotel. It's small. It's, it's right-sized for this community. And it has walkability accessibility, affordability, and sustainability. And those are the four things that we're working on. And we actually have plans for 12 units of housing there. Everything except the funding to construct. So we have a, you know, a certain number of people living out of their cars and in tents. And we have the Catholic Church across the street, which has been deconsecrated, that could be turned into emergency or short-term or transitional housing. Um, we have the idea of these affordable dwelling units, which could be dispersed housing, not centralized, 
the Homes Within Reach project that I was talking about earlier, that it would be in the core of the cent of the village, are centralized housing. And so that's a little mini community. But we also have the opportunity, because we are full of land out here, to have um, dispersed housing. So, and I think Lori can talk more about that, but you know, the kinds of housing where somebody's living in your backyard or you're living in your backyard and renting out your house, et cetera. So those are just some of the ideas that we have, but there, there are others. There's, you know, the idea of having, um, there's the idea of having supportive housing, you know, for groups of four or five people that's managed 24 seven um, by the Department of Health and or the Department of Community Services or mental health supports for people. That's the idea as well. So we have a lot of home builders here, people who've been doing this for years. Um, there's been a building boom out here, but they've been a little frustrated with HRM. That might change now, we'll see. Um, but we have a lot of builders who've sort of let go of the idea of building homes because it has been so frustrating uh, to navigate the requirements of HRM. And I'm not blaming HRM completely for this because HRM has a, a role to play in land use and all of that. Um, but it's been a little protective and a little bit of gatekeeping and people who you know have worked very, very hard to build their careers as builders and trained younger people to do it as well have gotten discouraged. So we're also hoping to encourage some of them to return to a more uh, small sized type of building project um, for this community. We know that they have the skill, the raw materials are right here. That's the advantage of rural. It hasn't taken hold here to the extent that we think it might. Um, there used to be rooming houses here. There used to be a lot of big houses or bigger houses that people would rent rooms out and they would make meals for each other and so on. That is something that is historically true of this place. Um, the rooming houses are gone and what people have now I think is a fairly um, private, a sense of privacy and you know I've got mine, this is my house, this is my space. Um, that said, um, it's been a, you know, a topic of conversation and in some cases we've seen some of our housing needy people have been taken into a house. Now it's a challenge if there are also mental health issues and that has been I think one of the deal breakers for many people who've shared a house and then found that it didn't work out for whatever reason. To me, I mean, I, you know, I went to college in Boston and, you know, you had your, you had your roommate, you're always looking for a roommate and you had to interview them and think about whether they were going to fit in. And sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. And that would always be a fraught situation. And I think it's a, sort of the 2021 ver 2023 version of, of that, you know, yeah, people would be willing to maybe build an ADU on their land, but not necessarily be willing to share their bathroom. Their concerns would, I think, that very much so, the concerns would be about who is this person, is this a stranger? Now that said, we have seen people taken in by people who have extra rooms in their house um, and housed, but they're usually people that, who they know them, maybe they're a relative, you know, they've been willing to take them in and take care of them. There are a few examples out here of people who have taken in people who are very challenged and vulnerable. And some of that has been very successful because the people who've taken them in have been willing to do the work of caring and of supporting. Um, and then we've had some examples where people have been kicked out <laughs> and sent back out. So I think it's a, it's a challenge of understanding the, the needs of the individual who who is in need of housing and what works best for them. And in many cases, what works best for people who might be taken in is a, something that's a more supportive situation where their medications are supported and they're given you know, tasks and activities to work on and work with. So when we think about the uh, 
the ecosystem, if you will, of housing in Muscadabit Harbor. We need all of these things. We need people willing to take in a roommate, a housemate, um, preferably somebody they know and can get along with or at least negotiate with getting along with. We need supportive housing that has 24-7 supports. We need transitional housing, people who are waiting to get into a place and have no place in the interim. Um, we need um, worker, worker supports, um, so small homes for people who are working who don't necessarily have a huge income but can afford something. And we need deeply affordable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I just think finger on the pulse is a really important point that you just made because the pulse is palpable. It's a small place. We see who's living in their car, right? We see who needs a place temporarily, just a warm bed. We see who is really in need of something a little bit deeper and longer. We see that these two women might really do well together. It's small enough to see those things. And I think that that's the advantage of a place like Muscadabit Harbor. The pulse is palpable. So one of the things that the seniors told us when we first did our first audit of who needs housing, the seniors all said, please don't stick us in a place by ourselves. We need the young people. You know, we need them to sweep, to sweep the leaves. We need them to, you know, shovel the snow, all of that. Uh, take us to the grocery store, you know, but also just have relationships across ages. And that's something that I think we do dream about. We have young people working here. If you go in the other room, you'll see there's young people here who have jobs here. They're not, you know, $80,000 a year jobs like they might be able to get in the city with their skill sets, but they want to be here and they found a way to make it work. And some of them have housing, some of them have housing needs. They all know young people who need housing, but our vision and our dream for Homes Within Reach includes having a workshop that people can you know, go and work in, um, laundry facilities that are shared where people can interact and help each other out so that it really becomes more of a small ecosystem of people of all ages. So, and I think that there's a certain amount I'm just going to go out on a limb here a little, okay? I'm from the States. The difference that I see here is that everybody has health care. They complain about it, they rain, rain, go on and on about it, but it is different because you can lose your job and you will not die from that. And you can still go to the doctor and you can still get, you know, a modicum of health care. It's mostly medical care, but you can get it. And my experience in the States has been that you can't leave your job. You are married to it. You can't leave the city and go live in the country and raise pigs because you will lose your health care. And I can't emphasize that enough, the difference. But that is part of what makes this work. That's part of it. So young people can hang out here and do a low-income job and, you know, hang out in the community and get odd jobs here or do this and that or and they're, they're going to be okay. As soon as we fix housing, they're going to be okay. I think you just have to get the right match. So we have one, I know we have one request from a couple who wants somebody to come who works during the day, but who will be available overnight. They can stay rent free as long as they sleep there and spend the night there. And if one of the people falls, we'll be able to call 911. So that exists, you know, these things come along periodically where somebody has a need, somebody else has a solution, we put them together. That can happen. It's, I just think we can't legislate it. You need, you need that kind of organization. And that organization needs capacity, right? We're very thin here. That's why we're talking about it all together, you know. It's not just the old school. We're having these conversations across with the Catholic Church, with the parish, and, you know, with affordable, with other affordable housing, you know, Affirmative Ventures is one of the people we're talking with, uh, is one of the organizations we're talking with as well. And, um, you know, we have all kinds of infrastructure conversations all the time. You know, there's tourism, there's housing, 
there's you know education there's all of these sectors here all talking together yeah a lot of it's word of a lot of it is word of mouth so things here happen on facebook facebook's very big so somebody would come on to facebook and say hey you know what i'm really out of oil or you know my landlord is being a jerk and i need to think about moving and so on and then other people come on and tell them oh why don't you call the old school or why don't you contact the lions or why don't you do this and so now we are all talking amongst ourselves so that we can actually say hey you know what go to the lions for this or you know maybe somebody over here can help you maybe that we can put you at the church for a while you know so we start to have this kind of infrastructure amongst ourselves right now it's completely voluntary there is no funding for this whatsoever it just happens amongst volunteers um, but yes i can imagine a housing entity that does take care of all of these aspects of the village including helping people share find roommates housemates to share with um, the other challenge here though is that these are families, a lot of people here are families who've been here for a long time. And so sometimes, you know, there's like, oh, that's my cousin, I'm not going there, you know, or, you know, oh yeah, I remember that person from my childhood. Yeah, maybe I should take them in. So there's a lot of that level of conversation that happens here that I think is different from maybe some other places like St. Margaret's Bay, which maybe has more people from away. So we have a lot of people from away here now. I will tell you that they are not necessarily yet engaged in this in this level of community work. They will be <laughs> because they need to be. So we're talking about maybe a housing cooperative, a nonprofit housing cooperative. We're talking about a community land trust for the community. We're talking about some um, other kinds of supports that we might engage with with the cath with the par the parish, um, with working with Department of Community Services, working with the Department of Mental Health, et cetera, et cetera, to have these kinds of uh, professional supports come in and work with us, and also use the volunteers better than maybe we have been, because they're they're much more specified. Like, okay, you're going to go do this for on Tuesdays, right? On Tuesdays, you're going to go sit at this place and work with these people and do something with them. Um, we have a certain amount of that happening right now, but not by design. It's just by interest, right? So the group across the hall, for example, Fiber Friends, there's a number of senior ladies in there doing beautiful fiber work that was started by one person who came to us and said, I want to do this. And we're like, okay, do it. Here's the space. So that level of conversation, um, I think, is a different one from the let's have a community meeting and talk about housing and what are we going to do about it. Um, things can happen at both of those levels. They could all be sitting over there talking about, you know, Sadie who needs a place. And somebody else goes, well, my cousin has a place. Well, okay, let's connect them up. Oh, yeah, your cousin knows her. You know, that level of informal conversation does happen. As, as does the community meeting. Community meeting, like, oh my God, what are we going to do about housing? You know, who's doing what? So it's happening at all those levels. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any of those levels alone can do it. I think it's for the reasons that I just, that we talked about earlier, which is that there's history, right? Um, there's also privacy concerns. Um, there's also people who just simply don't want to share a bathroom with other people. Um, and then there are people who, for whom it's great. It's a great idea, right? So it just really varies and you just can't predict. You know, I wouldn't necessarily predict that so-and-so and so-and-so would want to share a house. Turns out they did, right? But we don't know that. So as you said, it's not a pipeline in, pipeline out type of situation. It emerges and then we can help. So I love the suggestion that you made that there's an organization that exists where these two people come and say, we think we can make this work, and there's an organization and some staff that facilitate the agreement. 
Yeah, we had an enthusiastic community member who took in a very vulnerable community member, being quite sure that they could manage the situation well. We didn't have a lot of hope because the person that they were taking in didn't have a lot of supports. And it was all going to fall on the, the homeowner. And the homeowner did very well for about a month. And then it got to be too much. So I think that's the challenge is people um, up front thinking that, oh, this is going to be great, I can handle this, and not necessarily having the skills or the supports themselves to be able to help the person. That's sort of a worst case scenario. The best case scenario is these two women have been part of the bridge club forever. They're both suddenly, you know, they're both widowed, and they suddenly both have too much house, and they decide that they want to downsize both of them, and they find a little place to share and they need to work out an agreement. And maybe there's two bathrooms so they don't have to share the bathroom. I gotta tell you, that's the biggest, <laughs> that is one of the biggest barriers is people don't wanna share a bathroom. The other biggest barrier is pets. Somebody has a dog, somebody has a cat, well, we just can't make it work, you know, that kind of thing. So being able to have people think through about what all of the situations are rather than thinking, oh, this is a perfect solution to my problem I'll downsize and get a roommate. Um, you know, they have to think. Of, they have to think it through, and that takes education, and that takes the kind of organization that we were talking about earlier. I, I want to say we have solutions. They're here, and you're going to hear about them in a minute. <laughs> Some of them, and it's really a question of where's the support for the capacity building that needs to happen in order for these, all of these projects to happen. And then we could be an example and a model. You can scale this. It's possible.